This is a lecture four of the unit um, of unit two, two A. We're going to be doing chapter six and seven, and this is um, covering the latter part of chapter six. Now we know that political culture. This is kind of a review with some new stuff, and it flushes out some stuff that I think is missing from your from your book. Now we know that political culture is defined as the widely shared beliefs, uh, values, norms that citizens share about their government. And we know that there are some very uh, broadly based characteristics when it comes to these. And so I'm going to list them. There's um, uh, probably 10 or 11 of them as we go through this. Now, liberty is one that um, I think has a firm belief across uh, any boundary that we can think of. Um, gender, uh, socioeconomic uh, levels, um, ethnicity, race, etc. Um, there's not much uh, argument that most people value and share and uh, treasure their liberty. This though has, I think in a lot of ways, um, taken a hit. Now this up until the time of Herbert Hoover was the way Americans look at themselves. Um, we were rugged individualists. We didn't wait for a government to come in and help us out. If we dug a, if we dug ourselves a hole, we dug ourselves out of that hole. Um, and so that individualism stands in opposition to what uh, some Americans adopt today, and especially if you come from places perhaps like uh, like South America or Southeast Asia, where the state uh, intrudes into lives in a much greater way, um, and certainly not to the best of ways, but in, in, in a sense, people bring some of those, um, those views of government uh, to here when they immigrate. And so there's, a, there's most likely a larger number of people who who believe that the state should have an active part in your life. Now, what also brought about a, somewhat of the, 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 the destruction of rugged individualism was the Great Depression, when so many uh, had to rely on government handouts to survive with 25% unemployment rate in 31, 32, and 33. And even by 1939, 1940, the unemployment rate was 13, 14, 15%. Um, people were looking for uh, a helping hand. And since it didn't seem to be able to come from them, they did look to the state as a uh, as an entity that could bring them uh, relief. Nowadays, we do look to the state, uh, both state governments and federal government. Uh, we, we will turn to them when uh, the need seems uh, to be present. So natural disasters, for instance, are a place in which we see Americans look to the uh, to the government to assuage their uh, their uh, problems that they're facing, be it earthquake, flood, uh, or whatever. And, and the government usually, uh, through um, FEMA, through its National Guard, uh, through other other government agencies is usually there to help and we feel generally we feel comfortable with that and we get angry when it doesn't happen for instance uh, the 2005 federal response to hurricane uh, Katrina now the third characteristic is what we call equality now this is uh, the second time that we have uh, confronted um, equality we're going to be looking at it um, in a different way. Um, I think we did discuss this before, or we have discussed this before in class. But when we talk about equality, we're not talking about equality from the civil rights, civil um, liberties portion. We're looking at it from the perspective of the equality of opportunity, trying to make sure that the playing field is as level as possible, more than trying to legislate the type of results that come out. Women have to get 15% of the job, whether they're qualified or not, and the only qualification that you need is a woman, so or, you know, or something like, like that. And we're also looking at <clears throat> political equality more than economic equality. We're willing to accept a great deal of economic um, 
vitality in uh, people at the top uh, making much more than people at the bottom. It's political equality that's been the more important dynamic in the 230 years that we've been uh, a country, and this is what we look at for um, what we look at for uh, for uh, our civil liberties and our civil rights. Now, we also have what's known as a reverence for the American dream. We think that we can climb up that uh, socioeconomic ladder or that economic ladder. And even if we start low, we can make it high. That, that means there's some variability in the system. There's some expectations that you will rise. Unfortunately, we're looking at a generation now, this millennial generation, which may be the first one that doesn't live as well as their parents in a, in a, in a broad way. We've seen quite a bit of, of, a, of a destruction of wealth uh, since 2008. And it doesn't seem to be... Um, coming back any, anytime soon except at the very top, and there's some, I think, some reasons for that. Now, in 1944, FDR, as he started uh, looking at his fourth term, wanted to continue the, the state building that had occurred with a great, uh, the great deal of response, the, the New Deal that, um, that he, that was part of his government policy in dealing with the Great Depression. And he wanted to make sure that America didn't slip backwards. And so the second Bill of Rights is primarily the, the type of policy that ensured economic security. We'd already seen in the late 1930s Social Security uh, established. Um, and now there would, there, would, there would be other things uh, coming along that would not let Americans fall through uh, the economic floor, so to speak. And when it comes to equality, we have class that's primarily associated with the socioeconomic factors. And that's kind of different from the European experience where you had a, a sense of class consciousness and that's, that's still rather pervasive in, um, in Europe. And so consequently, ours is different. Ours is, uh, is more associated with uh, where you are on the, on the economic ladder. Now, this next thing gets a page of it by itself, because this is the essence of the drama that we have here in the country. We have conflict that is associated with liberty, and liberty is social, uh, associate, association with capitalism, and then equality, which is associated with democracy, and those two things butt heads quite often, and usually when they butt heads, that leads to some sort of federal uh, action. It can be affirmative action, it can be any number of things, but it does lead to some uh, federal action to remedy or to provide a remedy for the problem. <clears throat> now, here's some more things that you should be familiar with. Of course, we have a, a reverence for democracy, and we have a reverence for civic duty. Now, we used to have, or we look back historically at the demands by the Roman state, let's say, on its citizens. Um, ours is a little bit different. We expect the state to serve the citizen, not the citizen to serve the state. But in order for civic duty to work here in the United States, we have to have a class, a large class of people who understand political affairs. And the problem is a very small number of people, a very small class of, of Americans really understand um, the political dynamics of many types of situations that are occurring. And then your book touches upon the fact that we have developed a great deal of mistrust of government. Um, up through the 1950s, we were, you know, we were rather trustful of what the government told us, but starting with Vietnam, and so much of the, of the government's story was not exactly uh, true, um, and then continue with Watergate, we began to think that the government wasn't telling us the truth. And so consequently, there has been this mistrust in government that exists to this day, and yet we still expect the government to solve our problems. I don't personally, but I do understand that the government, having a size and with its wealth of wealth, let's say, it's, 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 it's wealth of tools, 
um, should be able to solve some of the problems that we face. Um, but the expectation of many people is it's got to be top-down. Government comes up with a solution, puts a solution into place, and we deal with the after effects. Where I think a lot of problems should be solved bottom up, and the government uh, responds and reacts to the demands that we have. It unfortunately, isn't like that too much. Now these two terms are are are, are three terms in a way you have to know. Um, Political efficacy simply is the capacity to understand and influence political events. But there's two types of political efficacy. One is internal. And internal means simply one's understanding of political affairs. And, and pretty much that's been stable since the 1950s. Where we have simply fallen apart are, is, is what we call external political efficacy. And it's a belief that one can have an impact upon government. And that has very much declined since the 1960s. Sometimes your teacher, me, I feel helpless to affect change. I keep working for it, but I feel sometimes rather helpless. It's as if uh, events and decisions are, are out of our control to influence. And I'm one of many people who feel like that. And so those are two terms you have to know, internal political efficacy, external political efficacy. Now our final three are when it comes to political culture are, are uh, as important as the ones up at top, but we don't look at it sometimes as, as much. We th theoretically have political intolerance. We are tolerant of other attitudes and other beliefs, but that probably has, has declined lately. If we look at the separation in the beliefs of the two parties and those who support both sides. So when we look at political intolerance, we probably mean more in the abstract way, but when we look at it in a more concrete way, we're not as tolerant as we think we are. Then there's pragmatism. And pragmatism means that Americans tend to be less ideological, which means that they can, they can um, support issues that are on both sides of the ideological line. So you can be, theoretically as American, you can be uh, pro-choice, but anti-gay marriage. Or you can be pro-gay marriage or, and, and be pro-life. Um, and that takes a position of both the conservative and the liberal um, sides of the issue. But Americans, unlike Europeans and perhaps <clears throat> people from other cultures, are much less ideological. We are much more pragmatic. Now when it comes to, finally, justice, we have a belief in the rule of law, that we're a government of laws and not men, and that we, we have to follow along. And it looks like I made a little bit of a mistake in the, uh, in the spelling, but it is what it is. Uh, I don't type very well. So now, let's look at etiology. Now, etiology is simply... Um, What does the person believe? Um, remember all those factors, school, media, family, put you on a road to having an integrated set of beliefs and values that shape who you are. And we know that when it comes to a political ideology, this is where you begin to have a feel for if you're conservative, if you're a liberal, if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, because what you think about politics, what you think about government policies, what you think about what government should do, are all wrapped up in the political politically political ideology uh, portion of ideology. Now, what we also know, and what presidents have discovered time and time again, is that people's political views change over time. A liberal can become a conservative. Yours truly has, has walked that path. Um, from maybe a liberal or more populist uh, approach when I was younger, 
to one that's more uh, conservative today as, as perhaps I don't like where the country goes. But this is very typical. Presidents have found that 25% of their judges make an ideological change over their time while they're on the bench. It's very frustrating. Um, Dwight Eisenhower was furious with where um, Earl Warren went as Chief Justice of the, of the Supreme Court from the early 1950s into the mid-1960s. Now, again, if we look at this, currently about 42, 40 to 42% of Americans are conservative. Another 33 to 40% is according to where conservatism, conservatives are, uh, are moderate. Liberals are anywhere from 20 to 25%. So there are obviously some teachers on campus who are in that liberal camp. But don't forget that they really are in the minority when it comes to thought. Though they act like they're in the majority. But they're not. Um, now, so there's another subset of this. There are people who always think in ideological terms. This is about 12% of the population. They are straight arrow liberals, or they're straight arrow conservatives, and their world revolves around their world revolves around those building blocks of their ideologies. And then there's a very large part of the population. You know, we are people who rely on party labels. Um, we're about four out of ten voters. Um, we call these people group benefit voters. Then there's the nature of the times. Current times are good. Current times are bad. About a quarter of the population will move, will move across the spectrum. So, for instance, right now, um, millennials. Uh, based on polling, seem to be abandoning the Democratic Party, who they went for in large numbers in 2008 and 2012, primarily because it looks like they're not happy about where where they're at in life and um, and what their expectations are in the in the future. So they're moving to the right. Um, and at the same time, there's about one fifth of the population. They base it on, oh my God, look at that hairdo he has, or, oh my God, can you believe the way she's dressed? Really, one-fifth of the population bases their views on what people look like. And that's kind of a sad comment on our time. It's not just what they look like, but it's it can be, you know, the, it, look at Sarah Palin. People either love her or hate her. And they'll base their, their vote on if she's associated with, the, with that issue. Go figure. Go figure. And we have to ask ourselves then, are these harmful to the system? Well, I think the middle group, group benefits, nature of times, are probably not harmful. Ideologues, there has to be somebody anchoring ideas. That last group really bothers me, though. But then, that's just me. So let's take a look at our first um, ideology. Liberalism. Now, believe it or not, classical liberalism is today's conservatism. Now you'll notice that Mr. Hobbes is up in the left-hand corner. Can anybody identify the woman in the right-hand corner? She is the author of a book that I have read five times. Every time I read it, I get more out of it. It's probably one of the favorite books by America's entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial class. She was a refugee from uh, the early Soviet years, and she has written um, the book or the book, Atlas Shrugged, which has had a, a great deal of, of influence on, on decision makers. So what do classical liberals believe in? Well, number one, a limited role for government. It sounds like today's conservatives, doesn't it? Secondly, government seen, was seen as the chief threat to liberty, just like today's conservatives. Uh, that government is best which governs least. Sounds like today's conservatives. Remember, these are the founders of the of the 18th century. Uh, the role of government is to protect property rights, which was the basis of providing the Constitution in, in, in many ways. That's the liberalism of the 18th century. But liberalism has now morphed into something different. First and foremost, liberals believe in an expanded role for government. Government does good. 
certainly the current president certainly feels like that, as do many leading members of the Democratic Party. Corporations are seen as the chief threat to liberty, hence the bringing up of Koch's and, and other groups, even though Democrats have actually raised more money in the 2014 campaign than Republicans have, and did also in 2012. Um, they feel that there's a need for a strong central government to smooth out the rough edges of capitalism. And what that means is tax the rich more, uh, let's engage in income uh, distribution, or, or what we call redistribution. Um, the role of government is to protect people's well-being. I can understand a little, a little of that. Um, I can understand smoothing out the rough edges of capitalism, um, trying to help take care of, of the poor. But this modern liberalism that, that I grew up with, um, I don't think e exists any longer. Now, the role of government in protecting people's well-being means that we spend more domestically on, uh, on different domestic programs. And it usually means that liberals are pro-choice, they favor affirmative action, and they favor pro-gay marriage, or they are pro-gay marriage. And we have seen liberalism um, kind of ebb and, and, and wane. Um, strong influence for uh, 40 to 45 years in the middle of the 20th century. Then with the ascension of Ronald Reagan, uh, a decline, an uptick under President Obama, but it really hasn't changed the dynamics of how many people feel that they're liberal and how many people feel that they're conservative or moderate. Now, there is a group called neoliberals, and you can see that um, the most gifted politician of this generation, uh, William Jefferson Clinton, California senior senator Dianne Feinstein, and a man who is now completely discredited, John Edwards, were kind of the, the you know, the movers and shakers of neoliberalism uh, in um, in the uh, the 1990s and into this century. Now, one of the reasons that neoliberalism has occurred was that there was a feeling that liberalism had gone too far, and there was a need to get back to more more individualism and less reliance on big government, and Clinton and Feinstein and Edwards and others um, developed this, uh, this, uh, this thought. Uh, I think it helped in creating the democratic group known as the Blue Dogs. And they are less likely to look upon government as the solution to problems. They're also, um, they look upon things as uh, that government certainly has a role to play, but not as big a role to play as uh, New Deal liberals uh, played in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And these three here, or at least two of them, uh, Clinton and John Edwards, were members of the Democratic Leadership Council, which was fairly influential in the 1970s and 1980s. Of course, Clinton made it to the presidency. Edwards, Edwards, what can you say about Edwards? You want to know about Edwards, just look him up. Conservatism. Now, essentially, of course, conservatism is the classical liberalism of the 18th century. And when you're a conservative, you believe in more military spending because you believe in strong defense. You're much more likely to be pro-life. You oppose affirmative action. Um, you want to keep taxes low. You want to keep more of your money. Give less to the government. Your anti-gay marriage, though I think that might be waning as a conservative issue. And conservative conservatives came, started coming back in the 1970s. It started with the um, with the uh, the coalescing of thought under Barry Goldwater and the John Birch Society in the 1960s, and then um, reached its zenith under under uh, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s and continued under Bush 41, and then I think Bush 43 has, uh, I, I, I really think we're looking back, though he might have been a conservative, he certainly didn't spend and, uh, nor act like one. Now the, um, the 104th to the 108th Congresses were all dominated by the GOP, and this was the congressional uh, Mount Everest for conservatism. And one of the things that we know in this is, is the, the strength of 
or conservative thought came out of what we call the Solid South. Remember the Solid South was solidly Democrat from the Civil War and became even more Democrat uh, after the, the New Deal was implemented. But starting in the 1960s, white men, then followed by white women and others, began to move to the Republican side. And so the 1970s saw the emerging of the Republican South, and that was been pretty much consolidated in the 1990s, though, though there are some states that might be purple rather than, than red now. Um, but we can see what's happened. If we look at the 2004 map uh, of presidential elections, we see that um, the red counties uh, voted Republican, the blue counties voted uh, Democrat. We can see that if you're looking at things ge geographically, you would jump to the conclusion that um, Republicans are the dominant party, but what you, if you understand if you understand geography, you'll notice that many of the blue spots uh, take in uh, the largest cities. If you look at California, there's the, the Bay Area, there's Los Angeles. Um, in Washington, there's Seattle. In, in Oregon, there's Portland. Um, in Southern Florida, there's Miami. So it's not a surprise. But this is what, what we would call the solid south. If you look at and the solid Midwest. And we're going to look at this again, this, this kind of map again, when we look at political parties. Now, just like the Democrats, the Republicans have also had a group that have um, developed uh, as a uh, as kind of response to policies that are in place. Now, neoconservatives um, where neoliberals were less liberal, neoconservatives are actually more to the uh, to the right of conservatives, and neoconservatives uh, and, uh, and uh, we've got to divide this up. Under neoconservatives, there are what we call the social polity conservatives, which are kind of on the wane right now. They emphasized issues like school prayer, anti-abortion anti-homosexuality. Uh, they were sometimes or many times known as the religious right. And some of their leaders we see here, uh, Pat Robertson up on the left, Pat, uh, Pat uh, Buchanan in the middle, uh, William Bennett uh, in, the, in the corner. Um, and what this led to was uh, um, a look at uh, faith being uh, a part of government. And actually in the Bush administration, they did, and I believe it's also continued into the Obama administration, there was uh, an office of what we call faith-based initiatives. They were supposed to uh, engage uh, religion in, in, the, uh, in helping government to promote social policy. Then there are the economic uh, neoconservatives. On the left is Steve Forbes, on the right is the, um, the late Jack, Jack Kemp, uh, who was a uh, vice presidential candidate under um, uh, the Bob Dole, and I believe that before that he was a Buffalo Bills quarterback in the early days of the AFL, American Football League, now it's known as the AFC. And the economic neoconservatives wanted to unleash market forces to attack various ills in society. They said nothing Nothing works better than pe letting people make choices rather than the government making choices. Um, I probably subscribe to that. Uh, I think you, what they say is if you uh, if we could just cut taxes and free up the free enterprise system from regulation, we would solve many of the economic problems that, uh, that plague our society. Then there are the foreign policy neocons. And this actually bestrides two different lines of thought. The first types of neoconservatives are what we call neo-isolationists. They shy away from intervention. Uh, they're wary, some of you who have read, they worry about the new world order, that there's this shadow world government that's going to take over everything. Um, they are very, very suspicious and wary of organizations like the UN, the WTO, which is the World Trade Organization, the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and many of them didn't even like NAFTA. 
But then there are others. And again, Pat Buchanan was part of that group. But then there are the others. Um, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and, and others who were more aggressive in dealing with foreign threats. And we certainly became much more aggressive after 9-11. Uh, but their concerns are, are terrorism, and they're much more supportive of what we call um, intervention. Now there's a third type of conservatism that, that's developed, and, and this was uh, coined by President Bush 43. Uh, not by the current president. I forgot to update this slide, sorry. Um, this is supposedly a more moderate brand of conservatism, again, because of the president's conversion to um, uh, Christianity. He was uh, you know, very faith-based. Um, but I think what you had to say about Bush 43 was that um, it was very, rather genuine um, in, in, uh, in his practice of religion. Now there's socialism. Now socialism, poster from 1984, is a system in which the means of production, distribution, and exchange are controlled by the government. So many Western European countries are socialist. Uh, so it definitely has had a strong impact in Western Europe. And the reason that it just never gained traction in the U.S. was that we always associated social, socialism with radicalism. And that clashed with our belief in, in rugged individualism. And it clashed in the belief of the American dream. And it clashed with the belief of uh, uh, our suspicion of big government. And that's very, that's in a lot of ways, the antithesis of the European experience. Now, the final strain of ideology that we'll look at is called libertarianism. And libertarianism is way over on the right, somewhat. Because really they're, they're worried about two things. There's an extreme emphasis on individual liberty. What you do behind closed doors is your business. No one else's. And secondly, they believe in a very, very small government. That essentially, government should only defend the nation. That's it. And that's pretty much their belief. I think a lot of, in a lot of ways, libertarianism is, is probably unworkable. But um, the, the best example of libertarianism in, con in modern American political thought would be um, Ron Paul and his son, Rand Paul. Rand Paul, of course, is the, um, the junior senator from uh, Kentucky. So that's our look at political ideology.